Hi, thank you for joining us today. I'm Corey Keysweater, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Forcepoint. I'm joined today by Nate Springer, our Director of Platform Engineering. And today we're gonna to be looking at a quick demo of our Zero Trust Network Access Capabilities, or ZTNA. Now, Forcepoint ZTNA is part of an overall converged security platform that is cloud native, called Force Point One. So this um, fits a, a new category that Gartner defined uh, about a year ago called SSE, Security Service Edge. It's, it's the security half of SASE. And ZTNA is kind of one of the hot topics around um, SSE capabilities. Basically, it provides an alternative to VPNs for users to access private applications in much the same way that users access cloud applications. So typically we'll have um, identity providers with a single sign-on page with the cloud application displayed. With this solution, you can have your private applications and your cloud applications all displayed in one place. Users can easily get to them. It gets rid of the issues associated with VPNs from a user perspective. I hate having to deal with them, know which one to connect through for which application, as well as the latency that it causes, it slows down performance. We don't see any of that, but even more importantly, it's part of a zero trust approach. And by that, I mean VPNs, once you're authenticated through the uh, and on the VPN, you have broad internet access. You can run a port scan and see everything that's on that network. With a zero trust net, uh, network access solution, that is no longer the case. You can only see the specific applications that you as an individual are given access uh, to. And so the big risk associated with VPNs where once a hacker has somebody's credentials, they can laterally move through, escalate privileges and get into anything on the network. That's no longer the case with ZTNA. So let's see this in action with Nate. Nate? Yeah, thank you, Corey. Yeah, so uh, again, there's a couple of use cases we're gonna run through. So the first use case will be agent, agentless ZTNA. And so agentless ZTNA is going to be more focused on your users that are on a device that is not corporate owned or third parties accessing internal resources, such as, you know, vendors or, or um, you know, third party uh, uh, that's, services. That's a, that's a very valuable point to highlight as well. A lot of times we'll talk to customers and they say, hey, uh, you know, all my employees are on managed devices, no worries. And then they don't... Uh, worry about or don't think about it until later, oh, we also have contractors or consultants mm -hmm. that we pay to help us. And a lot of times we pay them to help us work with things that are on private applications. And it's really hard to ensure consistent security and governance over how your own users, as well as contractors, access and use resources. So this gives you consistency. It's easier to manage for your admins as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so here is the application that we're going to be showing. Uh, we are only giving specific uh, access to a, a specific IP address on a specific service, port 8000 in this particular uh, data center where we have our connector installed. And so what the actual network looks like before I show the use case, if I come over here, you'll notice that we have a ZTNA connector here. This makes an outbound connection to the portal interface. And as long as the user is configured and set up or allowed to see that tile, it'll exist on their portal page. Again, this is agentless and it'll give them access to this Splunk server, which is not accessible outside of this network from the internet. Um, so what this looks like, if I open up a private window um, and you notice here, I have no agents on this machine. So this is purely a agentless uh, scenario. So we'll go to portal.usw.gloss.net. The user will log in. Uh, we'll be redirected to our single sign-on provider, as you should be, and we will log in. And again, this is the Force Point One portal, the user portal, right? Um, now, uh, if you use any other identity provider that has a user portal, um, you can use that. So you're not required to use this. If you're using Okta, we can use the Okta portal page. If it's uh, you know, ping fed, uh, anything like that when login. Again, these can be replicated inside of those environments for the user to click on and do exactly what I'm about to show you. So Splunk here is that internal, um, internal, uh, IP, uh, internal application. 
All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and click on the Splunk tile here to show that we are going to uh, make a connection to this internal application over the tunnel that was established from the connector out to our portal. Uh, and this is a Splunk app. It only exists inside of that network, that, that private internal data center. Um, you'll notice that the IP up here is actually going, it shows the internal address. It's dashified, but you'll notice it's at ztna.us.biglass.net. That is uh, now writing through that tunnel. Um, again, uh, you know, we can do things to this agentless application, uh, very similar to the way we do things for SaaS apps using reverse proxy. So I can restrict things like DLP inspection of files being uploaded or downloaded. Um, and so what we've done here is we restricted download. So basically preventing all downloads. I'm going to go ahead and start this download um, and then move away. It takes a minute for the Splunk server to actually create this file. Uh, but you'll notice that on the portal page here, uh, my policy page, that um, I do have a policy that says Splunk for only this demo user. And we are going to block all file downloads. Again, we can inspect uploads as well. Splunk is not really the proper app to, to test uploads, but this could go for any other internal application that would take an upload. Um, I, so, I want to take a, a second right here and sure. just highlight how valuable that screen is. I mean, paying attention to this, we're in a single pane of glass for policies across any application, any SaaS app, in, internal app, uh, the web. Uh, with force point one here. So whenever we define a DLP policy, we define it once for, let's say it's PII, PCI, something like that. And then we can inherit it, that same one that we've defined once across any application, cloud or private or the web. And that consistency, again, is what I was refer referring to at the beginning. We're not reduplicating efforts every time we're in a different um, nature of security. Well, for a cloud app, I've got to redo it and, and redefine the DLP. No, you do it once and you can inherit it wherever you need it. Exactly. Exactly. So um, back over to the page, uh, Splunk has created that file, that PDF, and tried to transfer it to this, this, uh, this particular session. You'll notice down here, if I click on this, we actually have removed all content because we are not allowing downloads from uh, that application. Uh, down to this particular endpoint because it's an unmanaged endpoint, untrusted, so therefore no data is removed. So again, uh, very similar to, to, to what we do with the reverse proxy for SaaS apps. So we built that technology into the agentless ZTNA portion. Um, very valuable there. Um, now what we'll go ahead and, and show you is uh, the agent-based side of things. So now what if it's a, it's, a re, it's a service that's not necessarily an HTTP, HTTPS app, um, but it's a service maybe like SSH, RDP, um, any actual, um, any TCP-based uh, protocol. Um, and so I, I want to take a moment there. There's a lot of um, use case, a majority of the user population for most organizations are typically going to be your HTTP, HTTPS apps. And there are a number of SSE or SASE vendors out there that can service those. But the ability to go beyond that, and while your help desk technicians may be a small portion of your overall user population, one of the most critical things that they're going to be doing is RDPing into your remote users in this hybrid world we're living in and, and fixing issues on their uh, desktops. You need that to also be managed and secured by the, with the consistent security that you're using across the rest of your organization. And this is a critical way of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you'll notice here that this is very similar to a, a firewall. Um, it's top down, first applied. Uh, I only have one rule here. Anything after this is an implicit deny. So I'm only allowing the single user. So what we'll do is we'll try to access SSH to this Ubuntu server on, a, um, on the, the NSBit demo. And then we'll go and try it on another machine that has a different user. Uh, we'll show you quickly here that we've uh, configured the data center, the ports. Uh, you can either do the host name or the internal uh, IP address. I gave a specific single IP, but you can actually give a range. So obviously there's a question comes up that what if we have a bunch of uh, different SSH servers, RDP, whatever it may be, you can put ranges of IPs in here that will only allow these services to uh, go over that tunnel. 
Um, so what does that look like over here? So again, you know, we have the diagram here. I'm accessing it from a separate network. So that's this, this network on the right hand side. It's totally separate from the one on the left. And we're going to, we have two different machines. First machine here has the user called demo. This user is allowed, and they, it was the one listed in uh, the policy. You'll notice here it says demo at nsbit.glass. That is the demo user. Um, so if we open a PuTTY and try to do an SSH to that uh, particular server, 172.16.10.101, which exists in the other network, uh, we'll go ahead and try to open that. And that will actually allow us to go ahead and, and log in. I'll go ahead and do that. And now I have access to that SSH server um, and only that particular SSH server. Um, and uh, what it would look like on a machine that also has the agent. So this is another machine here. And uh, this user is the Nate at nsbit.glass. Now remember that wasn't explicitly defined. So therefore there is, a, um, there is an implicit deny. So I therefore- I wanna stop there. I sure. wanna stop there and highlight that. That is, whenever you hear John, uh, you know, any of the experts on zero trust talk about zero trust, one of the first things they say is it's, um, with policy, you are either going to allow or you're going to deny. With zero trust, you default to deny everything and you only, actually that <laughs> it's efficient because you only have to worry about half the equation. In which scenarios do I allow? That's exactly mm -hmm. how our policy engine is built up. It aligns perfectly to zero trust. It's not just, uh, it's not only the the central place that identity plays, but also that aspect that we're going to implicitly deny everything unless it is explicitly allowed within the policy. That is how you follow zero trust on a, at a policy level. Exactly. And just a note, that applies for your SaaS applications, your ZTNA. It applies for anything on that policy page. So there's always at the very end, if you don't match any rule set, you are implicitly denied um, for secure reasons. Um, so what that looks like, uh, again, I'm a user that was not defined. So again, I will load this. You'll notice there's the IP address. Um, and I'll try to go ahead and open that. And we don't have access, right? So um, again, um, you know, this is how we uh, define the users that should have access to just that resource versus users that don't have access, won't even have uh, this, this. Now this tunnel is built from this, you know, from the agent uh, under the hood. So if you do have another application that uses that resource, again, it'll be built if it's the user that should have access. Again, this user did not and uh, this user did. Um, so if we go back over here to the portal, uh, we'll go ahead and look at a few things. So you'll notice I have a ZTNA uh, where I actually configure my data center. So you know the thing about this connector, so if we go back here and this connector here, you can install as many of these connectors within this data center that you want to, and they will all round robin and share load. So depending on the amount of load required for the particular app you need access to, just install more connectors. Um, and it'll you'll obviously have more of a redundant and resilient um, connection uh, as you maybe need to do upgrades to other servers as you bring down, them down and uh, update them and then bring them back up. So we, uh, we suggest a minimum of three, um, you can define multiple data centers as well. Um, and then we also have the ability to look at the connectors to see their status, um, obviously, if they're up or down. Um, again, if they need a software update, there is a command within the tool, within the connector itself that, that seamlessly allows it to do a, uh, an update coming from um, this repository here. And this is just showing you the details of, that, of the data that's riding over that tunnel um, from that connector. And so those are the two use cases. Uh, anything you want to add there, Corey? I, I think this was a great demo showing the use cases uh, for unmanaged device connectivity to a private application that adheres to zero trust, as well as managed device access to private applications that go beyond just HTTP and HTTPS to include other TCP protocols, things like SSH and RDP for those help desk technicians and admins um, yeah. that are also part of that user population. Excellent.
All right. And everybody watching, if there are any questions or concerns, please reach out to us. We'd love to show you a personalized demo to go over your specific environment, the applications you're concerned with, and your particular use case uh, and users that would need access to this. So we can show you exactly what we can do for you and the inline capabilities for DLP and malware that uh, malware prevention that go along with this. Thanks. Look forward to hearing from you soon.